So there is a clear unconscious bias to investing in women. And even in a developed country like the United States, women only get 4 to 7% of VC monies. So now if you add to that women who are marginalized, like women of color, rural women, or indigenous women, it's even harder for them to get access to capital. So that has to shift. And part of Angels of Impact's work is to flow money to women and indigenous communities and shift that balance of the funding gap. Angels of Impact is a connector that brings together the community-based enterprises, people who have the money, and at the same time, the talent and the skills from volunteers and experts who are willing to be able to give their time. Providing funding is not necessarily always enough. Instead, enterprises also need a community of support and learning to support them in any funding that they receive. Hence, we also do customized capacity building. Angels of Impact works with community-based enterprises all across Southeast Asia, as well as in the United States and New Zealand. We fund community-based enterprises, as well as provide them with customized capacity building. One example of the customized capacity building that Angels of Impact provides is the Women Impacting Social Entrepreneurship, or WISE, program. In this program, we bring together skill-based volunteers from around the region and we pair them with community-based enterprises based on the needs of those enterprises. We seek out women entrepreneurs in the community who are already doing the work. They are whom we call the weavers of society. Many of them are literal weavers, working to preserve the cultures and traditions of their communities. But even for those who work outside of the creative economy space, such as in sustainable agriculture, they too are the metaphorical weavers in the sense that they reinvest profits back into the health of their children or the education of their families, the overall betterment of society. They hold the fabric of society together. The impact of the work that we do at Angels of Impact is multifold. For one, enterprises in our network are plugged into a community of support. For another, they receive new skills and new knowledge, both from the Angels of Impact team as well as from skill-based volunteers. And finally, they have access to funding where they might not otherwise have had that access from which they can grow and scale their work. Angels of Impact has supported Ant Hill and personally me throughout this journey by really being fully present and finding um, so many ways and means to be able to support us in our current challenges. Finance has always been about making money from money. But when you're working with people who are at the community level, really helping their communities, and these are marginalized populations, you need to be looking at money as a source of empowerment. Money is medicine. And in that case, the model is very different. The kind of investor that comes in is very different. The terms you fund has to be restorative. It has to be able to empower people to heal planet and people. So in the next few years, we are actually really going to focus a lot more in the area of the restorative funding, the terms, as well as how we do capacity building. Women have been shown to give back up to 90% of their income to their communities. And when they give back to their communities, their communities do better. That in turn at scale affects the economy of an entire nation. And of course, when the economy of a nation does better, every individual household also benefits. The status quo is what has gotten us into this problem. What we need is new solutions, and the new solutions are on the ground. So I think this is the time for you to change the way you look at the world. Poverty is not here as something that we have to just live with. It is something you can do something about. We can all do something about. So I want to challenge you to think about poverty and how you can play the role in ending poverty. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the Impactful Woman Gathering 2021. This whole event, you know, if you're just joining us today, uh, is the culmination event for a year-long incubator under the ASEAN Women Impacting Social Enterprise or WISE Fellowship. Uh, and which this is a program that works with women and indigenous peoples driving meaningful change in their communities, building capacity for their community-based enterprises and addressing poverty in Southeast Asia. 
I'm Atika Amalina. I'm dialing in from Singapore today together with the rest of the Angels of Impact team and I'm honoured to be your MC for the event. Now, if you were with us here yesterday, you would have probably found that the platform is slightly different uh, from what you may be used to. Uh, I personally thoroughly enjoy using some of the features, especially because it does mimic a live conference. So if I do want to call your attention on, on the top tab, you have several tabs, right? You have the conference hall, you have the exhibitors, you have the lounge, and these features actually where we say that it mimics a physical conference, it's, usually, it's a space uh, for you to meet and interact with other attendees as well as the WISE fellows, right? So if you go onto the lounge section, for example, you will see, you know, photos of sofas and then there will be, you know, people um, that will be in the different sofa clusters. You, if you, you can find an empty sofa, you can just double click and then you can enter that uh, and then that will allow you to have a face-to-face when I say face-to-face, -face, a face-to-face -face virtual interaction with the other people in that cluster as well. Uh, so, you know, with, with everything that's been happening right now, we're not being able to travel, but we do want um, all of you to be able to still interact with each other as well. Um, I know we have chat moderators from the Angels of Impact team uh, who will be also interacting with you all. So say hello to them. I know some of you have already interacted with them both on the group chat as well as the individual chat as well as in the lounge. Uh, so I would definitely encourage you to utilize all of these various features uh, to make use of the best, uh, the best way of this platform. Uh, second thing that I do want to call out is that we do have live translations happening throughout the event. So we have five available translations. Uh, so you can choose the change language feature and then this will lead you to the language of your choice. Um, the other thing that, you know, that may be happening for you if you don't have uh, very strong internet access, you can also reduce the resolution um, through changing it in the gear icon as well. Now, there's so many different things that's happening, so I do want you to be able to fully capture the entire essence of this event. Um, do go on to the exhibitor lounge, uh, the exhibitor tab as well, where you can actually check out different booths by the community-based enterprises, and then you'll be able to rate and see all of the different amazing things that the WISE fellows have been up to, and then when you can rate them, we will have a People's Choice Award at the end of the session. All right, so I really just wanted to take a bit of time to go through that because I understand that the platform is a bit different uh, and we do want you to be able to fully maximize this conference uh, and by meeting all of the different folks and then we can be able to leverage and work together on this journey of alleviating poverty. So with that, there are multiple ways uh, that we can go into trying to figure out how we can support and I'll go, I'll go to that later. Uh, for now, yesterday we had such a great first day. Uh, we do want to make sure that we're catching up for that. Uh, we do have a highlight video of day one that we will be showing uh, for the highlight videos. So let's go and check out day one. Today marks the culmination of the year-long fellowship to support our women entrepreneurs. And it is an opportune moment for us to celebrate the power that women have to embark on their own paths of their own choosing and to play an active role to contribute fully to our community. To ensure that all women and men have equal rights. To achieve gender equality and empowerment of women, particularly amidst the challenges brought about the by the COVID-19 pandemic. We seek to change this as we see these women as weavers of the fabric of a resilient community. It is their hard work that inspires us, the volunteers and people in our network to offer our time, resources and networks to amplify their work. And we believe such partnerships between, you know, the public, the private and plural partnerships are, are, are really important to develop ASEAN economies and 
for sustainable reasons and also to drive inclusive growth. You know, after such an inspiring first day, I know some of you really felt, you know, that call to action that you do want to support. I know I immediately after the session went into all of the different websites and tried to figure out, oh, you know, there are certain things that I, can, I really do want to support uh, these fellows. I maybe already purchased some stuff as well. Um, but there are multiple ways that you can actually be supporting these wise fellows uh, this morning onwards, right? First of all, if you are interested in skill-based volunteering, please reach out to Angels or Impact uh, or the Enterprises directly. Uh, second, if you are interested in funding the enterprises, most enterprises have pitches in their booths under the exhibitor uh, tab. All right, you can also schedule a meeting with them one-on-one -on -one by clicking on their profile in the exhibitor tabs booth and selecting the meet button where you can then set up a time for a meeting, right? So during this time, they can provide you more details of the pitch and then you can figure out what's the best way forward uh, in terms of that support. Third, of course, there are ways to support Angels of Impact as well. They are doing such amazing work in making sure that we are enabling the community-based enterprises. You can find this on their website um, or at the Angels of Impact booth as well. We have several members of the team that are ready, like we have Tanvir, Safira, Pavani, Maddie, um, you may have met them on the chat as well because they are also our lovely chat moderators. So they are very happy to connect with you as well. So please reach out to them. They're a resource um, and they're super great people. All right. And fourth, and this is where I kind of had a bit of fun. If you are searching for holiday gifts or corporate purchases, you can check out the products of all the enterprises in their booths. Yesterday, we had so many conversations around sustainable fashion, how they were really upcycling and things like that. Uh, so you know that all your purchases are for a good cause. All right, so have fun. Please utilize all of the different features. Do meet the wise fellows, meet the uh, Angels of Impact team. I'll say hi to you later on as well. Um, so have a great day to today, right? With that, now that we've kind of made sure that we have all of the foundations set, I would love to call upon the first speaker of the day to give us her welcome address. We have Her Excellency Dr. Yang Mi Eng, the Executive Director of ASEAN Foundation with us today. Dr. Yang, please. Honourable partners, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. It is an honour and privilege for me to welcome all of you to Impactful Women Sustainable Movement to Empowerty event. As we navigate through the COVID-19 crisis, it becomes abundantly clear how important creative economy is to ASEAN's effort in achieving a resilient post-pandemic recovery. As one of the sectors that is heavily affected by the pandemic, creative industry are known to inspire entrepreneurships and generate economic opportunities in the region. Amid a COVID-19 disruption, the rise of digital transformation has rejuvenated creative economy while at the same time forcing those who are participating in it to adapt in order not to get left behind. This is, this is especially true for women-led social enterprises. As key drivers of creative economy in this region, women-led social enterprises must embrace digital transformation in order to continue serving the disadvantaged and marginalized while ensuring their sustainability of its business. The digital world has paved the way for women-led social enterprises in the creative economy to create new ventures, raise investment and strengthen promotional efforts. Digital technologies have also enabled the social enterprises to build and nurture relationships with people beyond their border. However, there remains a gap that prevents social enterprises in ASEAN to enjoy the same advances and it needs to be breached with initiatives that promote inclusive economic growth. In a concerted effort for, uh, to address this issue, ASEAN has launched the Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivity 2025. 
with a goal of achieving, achieving a seamlessly and comprehensively connected and integrated ASEAN community, this master plan will promote, among others, the adoption of technology and financial access through digital technologies for enterprises in the region. The ASEAN Foundation has taken a concrete step to contribute to the achievements of the master plan through the implementations of ASEAN Social Enterprise Development Programme. This programme in which 68% of its beneficiaries are women. This programme also strives to empower social enterprises in the region by harnessing technology and innovations as the way to support the growth of our beneficiaries' enterprises. I would like to use this opportunity to convey my deep appreciations to Angels of Impact, who is also ASEAN Foundation's partner, for creating a safe space for the social, entrepreneur, uh, social entrepreneurships. Their skill-based volunteers, as well as other thought leaders across the creative economy to spark cross-sector solutions to end poverty across ASEAN. So I want to congratulate uh, Angels of Impact for successfully doing this work uh, for the past five years. So I would also like to congratulate all 17 social enterprises for successfully uh, joining ASEAN WISE Fellowship journey. So you have completed the journey and I hope that the learnings that you have received from this program will help strengthen the work of your social enterprise in the years to come. So I wish you all the best and uh, uh, success in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Yang. It's so good to know that there's so much support going into community-based and social enterprises in the region. So thank you for sharing about that. Next up, we have Ms. Antonia Hui, the co-founder of AL Wealth Partners, with her opening remarks. Ms. Antonia, please. Hi, everybody. My name is Antonia Hui. Greetings from Singapore. I've been uh, very honoured to be invited to give you this short speech to welcome you to this significant event. I remember when I grew up in Hong Kong, uh, because I come from a very poor family and we don't have enough money to even feed all six of us. So I came to know that there is a factory that outsourcing assembly work to low income family to assemble plastic flour to make Christmas tree and Christmas wreath and to export it from Hong Kong to other part of the world. And incidentally, when I grew up, um, this particular factory was actually found and created by the current Li Ka Xing, as you know, he's the richest person in Asia. And by the time I was only five and a half years old. So I went with my two brothers and decided to register to get some work. And so we collected our first batch of materials, learned how to make the uh, tree and the reef at home. And then when we completed the whole thing, we returned the finished product to the factory. And then in exchange, we'll be given the money. But they have never checked that how we're going to utilize the raw material they are given to us. And we end up with quite a bit of excess. And so what we did is me and my sibling decided to actually assemble the other trees and the other reef and then went to the market and then sell it there and make our extra money. So I believe that entrepreneurship come out of survivorship uh, most of the time. And because of that, I'm able to support my family in terms of food money, as well as the educational money for myself and my sister. And that is where I am now. What makes the difference of a good entrepreneur versus those people who are only out there just to make one thing is about success. For me, it is first of all, know yourself. So to motivate the other people like myself to help um, funding your initiative. The important thing is for us to understand what really drives your idea, how sustainable and viable it is. And because of that, what is the true motivation behind it? Is it because you want to bring a better environment to your own family and your community? And I think if there is an enough hunger and drive and determination, that already give us a lot of motivation to support you. 
And I think we need to understand government has a lot of other initiative. They may not fully have the capability to look after everybody in the community. But I think for the government to understand how, why social enterprise is equally, if not very important for a country and a community is if you want to eradicate poverty, poverty bring along with a lot of social issue, a lot of social burden to a, to a government or a country. And if we are able to have social enterprise to help to improve the income equality as well as remove and eradicate poverty, this is what is the primary reason for any government have to be basically supporting and working alongside with social enterprises in order to improve this environment for the country. So for the other philanthropies, I think that we all understand that we tend to assess our philanthropy dollars, um, whether they're well spent by checking whether there's good governance and also there's a structural way of doing it. However, when you come to uh, talk about grassroots philanthropies, what matters most is the timely action to support with a realistic and pragmatic expectation that often small win and impact can become big impact and making good changes that someone's life and some community one day will become as big as the philanthropies that you are yourself or people that they're going to serve. So I think to give the idea and the chances of this new social enterprise to flourish and let, the, and let them to learn to make small wave into big wave. Our contribution should not be measured by data and monetary outcome, but by the emotional quality and value and the impact that can be, cannot be measured by dollar value. So I would urge all the philanthropists who actually believing in eradicating poverty and also to bring income equality to any society to look at it, how we started small with grassroots uh, social enterprise and be able to help them to make the changes that will actually compound it, become a big changes fundamentally good for everybody. I think it is a two-way uh, relationship without a social enterprise uh, entrepreneur who demonstrate that they have the right sustainable and viable idea and, and projects that they are able to not just um, asking for donation money, but most important is to be helping their own community and themselves to be elevating poverty or improving the income level of, of their community. And this will be eventually attracting and impacting on those philanthropy who are looking to help grassroots community to actually improve their livelihood as well. And so all you need to do is be courageous and resilient and take one step at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Antonia. You know, being courageous, being resilient, taking one step at a time is really such a great advice for all of us as we're trying to navigate this pandemic. I do also want to call out a huge thank you for your very generous contribution uh, for the COVID Relief Fund that uh, has helped many of the Wise Fellows uh, that's here today as well. So thank you so much. Um, next up, I am very pleased to be calling on stage uh, Ms. Georgette Tan, the President of United Women Singapore, to the stage uh, for her opening address. Ms. Georgette Tan, please. Good morning, everyone. My name is Georgette Tan, and I'm the President of United Women Singapore, a Singapore-based nonprofit community organization focused on gender equality, women's empowerment, and building the pathway, the pipeline of future women leaders. I am delighted, no, honored to be invited by my dear friend, Lena Green, to speak to you today on a topic that is very close to my heart, that of women being key to sustainability and development. Many of you know that 80%, that's 80% of people displaced by climate change are in fact women. Women are disproportionately impacted by climate change. But women are also in the best position 
to do the most and hold solutions for both people and planet. Whether it's upstream, like in agriculture, or midstream, production, the supply chain, and the creative economy in particular, or downstream, and here I mean consumers with discretionary purchasing power, women play a critical role. Let's for a moment focus on the creative economy. After all, this seems appropriate given this is the UN year of creative economy. And this is where we see how critical a role women play in all forms of sustainability and, and sustained development. For a start, women make better choices when it comes to maintaining environmentally friendly habits. Women in the creative economy not only come up with innovative solutions to tackle real life issues, they also provide employment to other women. I'm speaking here of that multiplier effect that we all talk about. But it's not just the supply chain. I'm talking about specifically the value chain that women create and sustain. I believe when it comes to the women in the creative economy, it's all about value creation. I'm highlighting value both in terms of input and output. On the input side of the equation, we're talking about better use of resources, recycling, upcycling, leaving a smaller carbon footprint, all resulting in value added products as output, whether it's fabric, weaving, clothing, natural clothing, baskets, accessories, all these things that I'm talking about. And here, you know, I'm referring to the 17 amazing social enterprises featured from the region. It's all about creation of value add. But it's also more than that. Value creation comes about from the tradition that gets revived and that lives on through knowledge transfer through these creative eco economies. I think it's clear that women play a critical role in both sustainability and sustained development when it comes to the creative economy. Bottom line, women care more about the planet and want to make it a better place for the next generation. Women make a conscious decision to be sustainable, both by choice and necessity. They understand the importance of ensuring sustainability in their work and products. Let me end with the thought that I started with initially, that women are key to sustainability and development, that they have the most to lose, but also the most to give, they just need to be given a chance to do so. They need to be given the opportunity to be the stewards, to be the sentinels of sustainability. Let's start by lending support to these 17 women-led social enterprises featured but let's not stop there. Our work has just started. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Georgia Tan. I especially, especially value um, the part where she said that, you know, a lot of women-led and community-based enterprises uh, create such an extensive value creation change, right? We know from our own fellows at WISE that 
there is an aggregated impact when we a woman help other women earn an income and this woman in turn reinvest their earnings into their communities and there's this whole value creation and value chain um, that really gives back more than we can actually imagine so thank you so much for for actually putting that out there um, because we know this is why we do the work that we do at the 2021 wise fellowship now, in day one, we had the opportunity to get to know six of the community-based enterprises in the uh, creative economy. And we, in total, we have 17 across nine ASEAN countries. Now, today, we will have the great opportunity to know more of uh, the, this uh, community-based enterprises. And I am very, very glad to introduce the first one who will be joining us, who is um, the Mandaram Longhouse Crafts. Let's begin with Mandaram's presentation. Nama saya Kelumi Anak Umpuk, uh, berumur 36 tahun. Oh, nama aku Berika Anak Teliang. Nama saya Hensona Anak Munah. Saya juga selaku Ketua Biro Wanita di Rumah Panjang, Panjang Mandaram sendiri yang mempunyai ahli seramai 25 orang. Biro Wanita di Rumah Panjang Mandaram Besar ditubuhkan pada tahun 2008 yang pada masa itu mempunyai, hanya mempunyai 8 orang ahli saja tapi dari tahun ke tahun memandangkan minat dalam dalam bidang kraft tangan ini ramai yang menampilkan diri untuk menyertai Biro Wanita di Rumah Panjang sehingga hari ini kami Biro Wanita di Rumah Panjang Mandaram Besar mempunyai 25 ahli Hari Mit belajar, hari Indai, hari Ibu kami belajar dan beranyam. Nganyam B kami belajar orang. Baik saya Indai, saya dan Ibu kerja. Pengalaman saya bekerja bersama dengan Biro Nita di sini adalah kerana dapat berkomunikasi dengan mereka, dapat bekerjasama, dapat minta tunjuk ajar dan penglibatan uh, community bagi saya da dalam biro ini uh, dari segi emosi saya berasa bangga dapat menaikkan taraf ekonomi uh, dari segi sosial juga saya <coughs> mampu mengembangkan dan mampu mengembangkan kraf uh, tangan untuk dipamerkan di tempat-tempat tem lain dan juga ikut pameran-pameran dan di mana juga ada expo Pada tahun 2008, bermulanya era baru bagi rumah panjang mandaran besar dengan tertubuhnya biro wanita yang disokong oleh uh, Jabatan Daerah Belayut yang pada masa itu telah mengangkat produk-produk yang ada di rumah panjang mandaran besar menjadi satu kampung, satu produk dan disokong oleh Kementerian Halewal dalam negeri pada masa itu dan hingga kini. Sebab-sebab saya menyukai kraft tangan ini adalah untuk menyambung uh, tradisi ini. Harapan saya uh, mengenai biro ini dan kraft tangan ini uh, memberi peluang kepada uh, warga muda, iaitu generasi yang akan datang uh, supaya tak uh, supaya dapat meneruskan uh, dan dan uh, memberi tunjuk ajar kepada mana-mana yang individu yang ingin belajar dan juga mampu uh, mem memberikan uh, jika ada peluang untuk kelas ataupun tuition ataupun mana-mana uh, anjuran mungkin dapat membuka minda kepada generasi akan datang khususnya remaja masa kini. Anak-anak semua ambil, anak rumah ada nyi lauk, lepas kita berdau tahu megai, berdau megai. Anak ngai belajar ngai warutan mula-mula rintas menyenai nyadi mepupuah nyadi kita ya anak anak lembau na silau kita belajar belajar mana mana ya terima kasih ya. Hi Hansona, so glad to see you today. Now I'm very interested about the traditional arts uh, that you actually you know, have with your brands. Uh, have you actually taught this traditional art to others? You know, and what is really the importance of passing on such traditions? Yes, I have taught our development in our engineering community 
to do the traditional way of weaving our basket and bags and other handicraft. And I learned the art of weaving, watching my mother wear basket every day and learn to love and appreciate her craftsmanship. This inspired me to try weaving and she encouraged me as I learned along the way. This is the skill that she grew up with her time as a mother also taught me, taught her. I feel honored to carry on the tradition of weaving which our community, our indigenous community is known for. And I believe it is very important to pass on the tradition of weaving to our younger generation to preserve our talent as skilled artisan. The unique design that we feature in our handicraft, like in our basket and bags, tell our story, our heritage, and that is the way of also preserving our identity, identity in our engineering community. I want the younger generation to feel proud of their roots at the same way as we have been taught by our parents and grandparents before. Furthermore, having the skill to weave quality and beautifully designed bags and basket is something that the younger generation can do as a home-based business where they can earn extra income to make them financially independent. I believe that women sh should know how to generate their own income so they can help support their family with some hard work and preservance. The traditional of Mandaram woven arts will be sustained and preserved in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and your wisdom with us. I'm very excited to check out your products as well. I'll see you soon. Up next, we have Woven Crafts joining us. A skill like weaving is very tactile. It's very in touch with being able to ground yourself. You're literally on the ground. You're on the floor of your home. You're on the floor of any place you're staying. We started Woven back in 2014. This was in response to Super Typhoon Yolanda. We work with different artisan groups around the Philippines with traditional materials and processes to create modern items, like fun and vibrant items that people would use in their day-to-day. -day. One of the main pillars that we care deeply about is being able to make sure that we're giving back to the community. So how do we do that? First, we want to make sure that they're paid fairly. What was happening before was that since they were dealing on a one-to-one -one basis, it's very easy for the businessman or the businesswoman to say, oh, this is the price I'm willing to pay, take it or leave it. But then with us, it's the other way around. Uh, it's the weavers telling us that this is our price, but that's what we wanted to happen. They should be the one dictating the price which they think is fair for them. What Woven brings to the table is really creating value-added products with our artisans, designing it together with feedback from the market and linking them to these markets, introducing technologies for quality control and systems and procedures. We've also been doing a lot of investing in assets for the community, which is fully owned by them, like sewing machines, weaving centers, even the plantations where yeah. they source their raw materials, and training, so upskilling. Yeah capacity building. We've seen some weavers who have been weaving their whole lives and learning how to sew so they can yeah. earn more. Yeah. Right now, we're working with almost 200 different weavers from different parts of the country. The main one is the one in Samar. They're the ones that are badly hit by the typhoon. After the typhoon, a lot of people do feel a little bit of trauma, but when they weave, they weave with each other. It's also time for them to chat. So it's not just a matter of creating, we also want them to feel much closer with each other, to work together, and also to reach out. One thing that is personally that I, I find fulfilling also with Woven is that we've been able to form youth groups. We've been holding creativity workshops for them, leadership workshops together with uh, the Work Together Foundation in Korea. After Yolanda, I've seen what disasters can do to these people. And in the midst of that, you do find stories of hope and stories of trying to change the situation. What we hope is to be able to show people that traditional crafts have a place in the modern life. Our products become a tangible form of identity. Being able to say that I come from this place, this is my story, this is what we stand for. 
through our products, we hope you can explore more about Filipino traditions and processes and get to know the stories behind the products and the communities who make them happen. Hi Trish, welcome and uh, thanks for joining me today. I you know, would love to know, do you have anything you would like to say to the community of people who've joined with us today? So your support means a lot, whether it's just sharing the stories be behind our products or asking us about our advocacy. It does mean a lot to our partner artisans that um, their products are getting known in different markets. But um, all the different kinds of support that we've gotten from here as well, Angels of Impact, I think it's it's done so much good for not just our business, but also for our partner communities. So um, please view our products as a way to connect with, with these artisans and um, get to know the people behind these products. Thank you, Trish. I'm sure like the community today will be here to support you and all of the other community-based enterprises. Uh, so we're looking forward to be checking out your booths together with the rest as well. Next, let's welcome Tora Jamelo. My name is Fide. I am a man and social media associate in Tora Jamelo. My name is Kartika. I play a role in sales and marketing in Tora Jamelo. I'm Karina. I'm the retail and production manager at Tora Jamelo. Hi, I'm Alparna. I'm the CEO of Tora Jamelo. Tora Jamelo is an impact business registered in Indonesia. We work with women-led indigenous communities that work with handwoven textiles. And we do this via our three C's. Commerce, which is our slow ethical lifestyle brand to showcase the handwoven textiles by these indigenous communities. Community collaboration, where we work closely with our communities to upskill and train them on market trends and also help them preserve their indigenous handwoven textiles. And finally, consultancy, where we actually work with other social enterprises and businesses and help them on their path of sustainability and ESG via our strategic inputs. We're working with 1,100 artisans from Toraja, South Sulawesi, Nusa Tenggara Barat, and Nusa Tenggara Timur. The problems faced by these communities are multifaceted around social, cultural, and economic barriers because most of our women weavers are single women or widows. Most of them have to move to another cities or country to work and find another job opportunity to continue in their life. And what Tora Jamelo aim is to bring them back to the country and have a decent livelihood. Tora Jamelo also prepares uh, the community for the global market. So we also create a program for capacity building and regeneration for the handwoven techniques and motifs. By having the skill set, the weavers can actually count their profit margins and then they can also learn how to adapt their products to the market. There's this saying that alone you can go faster, but together you go longer. We do not exist in isolation and we cannot be insular and I think we can maximize our impact if we work together. We decided to have a consultancy arm where using our learnings, lessons and mistakes that we have faced over the past years, we now work with other social enterprises on a pro bono level and with other businesses who are on their path of ESG in order for them to be able to make impact in a better manner and also in a sustainable manner. The future of business is that every business has to be a social business because we do not operate in isolation from our environment and societies. And we need more businesses to recognize this and walk on this path because then not only businesses can survive and thrive, but also the environment and the societies that they work along with are able to move along with them in a sustainable manner so that all stakeholders and not just the shareholders benefit from the business. We need more and more people to be involved, especially the younger generation, because they need to take this mission forward. So I reach out to you all to please join this movement and help preserve 
the cultural, environmental and social heritage of this beautiful Mother Earth that we live in. Hi Aparna, I am loving the colors and the fabrics for your products. Now I'm interested to know, how do your products fit into the slow fashion movement? What do you think? Hi Atika, thank you for your questions. Our products definitely fit into the slow ethical fashion industry because we work with artisanal women weavers. So definitely they're not part of the fast fashion industry. These are indigenous weavers and then they create uh, these handwoven textiles by their hand. So essentially we are honoring their handicrafts, their craftswomanship. And then uh, we source the other products that go into creating a final end product, be it fashion or non-fashion, by working with uh, small and medium enterprises, production houses, which definitely are also not part of the fast fashion industry. We are incorporating green and ethical processes. And therefore, our aim is to not basically cater to the mass market, but for the money for value market where you honor the work done by each of these players in creating this final product that lands up in hands of our consumers, who we also believe to be conscious consumers who believe in slow ethical uh, fashion movement and not fast fashion, which is take make waste. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I'm really excited to catch up with you later. See ya. And last but certainly not least, we have Kamana joining us. One of the questions we ask ourselves is like, why is it that when you talk about a bag or an accessory and you say made in Europe, everyone goes wow, and automatically you think about quality, but the opposite happens when it comes to something that is made in, in Southeast Asia and in Indonesia and in other parts of this region. We want to start changing that narrative to show that in Indonesia and in other countries in Southeast Asia, it's possible to make those beautiful products because the crafts are there. Nama saya JJ. Di Kemana Travel Bag ini saya bekerja sebagai pembuat desain dan pola. Nama saya Sugito. Saya bekerja di Kemana Travel Bag. Saya di sini sebagai pengrajin anyaman. Hi, my name is Bea and I'm the co-founder of Kemana. Kemana is a creative studio that is based in Indonesia and in Singapore. We are deeply committed to the principles of slow fashion and to sustainability. It's really part of our DNA. What we do is we honor, we celebrate, we take crafts from this part of the world and then we infuse them with contemporary design. The richness of crafts in this part of the world is amazing, it's endless. One of the things we want to do with Kemana is really to start changing the narrative and the perceptions around the crafts in Southeast Asia. So this is our mission, to act as a bridge and to show to the world the beauty of all those crafts that are made in this part of the world and doing it in partnership with the artisans. One of the things we say is that why should we do what others can do better than us? We really work with a network of weavers and artisans and silversmiths and different workshops, often family-run, with whom we co-create and collaborate to make the products. And they are the ones defining the price, telling us the capacity they have and the time that they need to produce. So we try to adjust and to adapt. We don't ask for exclusivity. We help them and provide them with facility development, helping them to access the right equipment so that they can upgrade their quality and have access to other brands and also to other markets. For us, sustainability is part of our core, part of our DNA. It's not something we are adding. One of the inspirations for Kemana has been a suitcase from my grandfather that I still have and that it's like 50 years old and it's still there. So it's that whole idea of making things that last, buying less and buying better. The second pillar of sustainability has to do with the materials that we use. And we have a mantra that is from the earth back to the earth. So we have walked a long path to make sure that the calf heights that we use are vegetable tan, minimizing the chemicals that are used. We use bamboo in our packaging of our bags. So really trying to be gentle and kind towards the environment. We can all shake the world in a gentle way. And this is our vision that we can start changing the narrative 
about sustainability, but also that made in Southeast Asia means quality, attention to details, means artistry, means ancestral techniques that are still alive. Saya berharap agar generasi mendatang tetap melestarikan tradisi dan budaya nenek moyang kita supaya tidak tergerus oleh perkembangan zaman. So be curious and start looking for them because they're here. Hi, Bea. Thank you for joining us today. Now, you work with such a wonderful community of artisans. Uh, I would love for us to share uh, what, does, what support does your community of artisans need most in 2022? Thank you for this question. Yeah, um, what we are seeing throughout the community of artisans we work with, either like the weavers or the leather tanners or the leather artisans, is that most of them need funding. 2021 has been a very hard year for them and even 2020 because of COVID and because many orders were put on hold. And many of them need funding to be able to access uh, and upscale their equipment and to buy like uh, supplies and even also like capacity development so as to be better in what they do. And in addition to funding, I think one very important thing that they need is access, access to markets, access to brands like us and other brands so as to be able to sell um, their products, what they do, and to be able to, to earn that income and to continue going. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Bea, for that, for that really important note, right? In the beginning, I, I said, you know, how are some ways that we can actually support this social community-based enterprises? And one of it is really to actually be purchasing their products. Uh, I know this because I've kind of gone on all their websites and try to figure out, you know, are there any ones that I can actually support? Uh, for those of you who are based in Singapore, um, they are, they, we do have partners uh, who actually uh, store their products and actually sell them. So we do have uh, Market for Good as well as Green Collective, uh, where they actually actually have these products and you can actually buy from them. Otherwise, you know, you can actually buy straight um, from these community-based enterprises and then pay for the relevant shipping wherever you are in the world. I know some of them have such beautiful products. I have been putting a list that I can put together for Christmas. Uh, so you may want to do that as well because this, um, your support goes a long way to all of these community-based enterprises as well. Now, we are, I'm excited to go on to the next item in the agenda. Uh, however, this is the point of time where I remind the 17 community-based enterprises that you will have a separate session going on right now. So this is where you leave the session and then you click on the impact management session in the conference hall tab. Now, when you click on that, this will redirect you to the Zoom room and we have Miss Sarah and Miss Katia there who will guide you through the survey and the next activity uh, in the next hour. I dare to remind you, please come back to us after this session. Uh, so, we'll see you in, in an hour, yeah? So, 17, all you community-based enterprises, I'll see you later. Now, for everyone else, please stay with me, <laughs> stay with us. Uh, we are going to have a special treat. Um, if you remember yesterday at day one, we had the melodious tune of um, Kaya Lore's song about preserving the environment. Today, we have another thre uh, track from uh, Here and Found's artist, uh, this time round by an indigenous woman, uh, Yapo from the Bangloi community. And this track actually is about cherishing sweet memories from the good old days about rice farming and how easy it was to grow sustainably without harming the environment. And Yapo actually, fun fact, learned this track from her father. So ladies and gentlemen and everyone else, uh, please enjoy this beautiful song by Yapo. So you are coming in.
กือกืนดูแลจะเธอจมบาพอปัดตูลอปัดจานนพอปัดตูลอปัดจานนายูพอจูแล้วพอเธอพอเธอเธอเก็บจูช้าเมนดูกูเธอเก็บจูช้าเมนดูกูยูพอจูแล้วพอเธอพอมาเธอเก็บจูช้าเมนดูมาเธอเก็บจูช้าเมนดูเวลคัมเอเวอรี่บอดี้แบ็กอีกแล้ววันนั้นนั่นคือเพลงที่สุดที่เราได้ฟังมาเกี่ยวกับการสัมผัสกับสิ่งแวดล้อมที่เกี่ยวข้องกับธรรมชาติวันนี้ชื่อเพลงนี้จะเป็นการสัมผัสกับการเก็บเงินและเราอยากให้คุณได้ใช้สิทธิ์ในการคิดแบบใหม่โอเคที่นี่ในอาเซียนแบนเนอร์ของดูดีดูดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดีดี Even mainstream investment banking now has asset classes for impact investing, but after all these years of impact investing, we still do not have true systems change. We have even greater social and deeper problems. In any case, the Monitor Group report actually, back in 2012, already pointed out that impact investors who'd look to do good and do well tend. Not to invest in poverty alleviation. More recently, the 2020 Jin Annual Report actually confirmed this, and it showed that more than two thirds of impact investors actually look for either market returns or just a little bit less than market returns. And our own research report published in 2018 also shows that there's a clear mismatch of expectations between investors and community-based enterprises. So community-based enterprises, which are too big for microfinance and yet too small for impact investing, tend to fall in the missing middle and face a funding gap. The Monitor Group report in that report called for philanthropic dollars to fill this gap, and they called it venture philanthropy. Namaka Akbo calls it restorative investing, and more recently, even Bill Gates called it catalytic philanthropy. Ultimately, it is about shifting money that is not looking for market returns to really help marginalized communities to build back better. Someone I really look up to, whose name is Namaka Agbo, is the CEO of a $450 million fund called the Katali Fund. And I call her the mother of the term restorative economics. She reminds us that it is time to dream bigger and build an economy that heals and restores marginalized communities that are actually creating a more just and prosperous world for all of us. We need to know that restorative investing is not just about flowing money to women or marginalized communities, but also about how we invest. Restorative finance calls us to look a little deeper to examine not just the implicit biases of who we invest into, but also the due diligence process, how we seek and look at risk, the terms in which we give funding to. Do we extract profits from entrepreneurs and the community instead of helping them rebuild their wealth? Even impact metrics that we talk about tend to be determined by the investor as opposed to the one in the community connections or with the lived experience. So they end up tending to add more work and burden the entrepreneur. Today's panel on restorative investing and the role of philanthropy 
is meant to highlight the need for a new form of financing. As I said earlier, money is medicine. When we try to restore wealth in the marginalized communities, really to help end poverty. We hope to elaborate on not just flowing funding to marginalized entrepreneurs, but also how and the type of funding they need. How philanthropic dollars can actually be used to enable non-extractive, entrepreneur-friendly, affordable, and really restorative investing. We have a very esteemed panel today with us who are pioneers and already walking the talk leading the way for restorative investing. We have with us Jamie Glochet, co-founder and co-director of Native Women Lead, Jasper Van Breckel, CEO of RSF Social Finance, and Kate Cochran, CEO of Apaya Ventures. I'd love to welcome everyone on stage now. Thank you so much for dialing in. I know it's kind of late in the evening from where you are. We are truly, truly honored to have you us here with us. You all have very esteemed backgrounds, which I encourage everyone in the audience to go online and Google them and find out more about them on LinkedIn. So I thought it would actually be nicer to have you introduce yourself and your organization really quickly and how you fit into the space of restorative investing. And Jamie, as the indigenous woman on our panel, I'd love to give you the first word. Jamie. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jamie Glochet. Yate, Shay, Jamie Glochet, and Asha, Nakaida, Nanishla, Sanajani, and Asha Che, Zafagai Fashish Chin. That's my introduction in Navajo. I'm also a white man, Apache, in Kiowa. Um, raised and born here in the Southwest um, in the United States, also residing in Tiwa territory, also known as Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, thank you again for the invitation. Um, as Lina said, I'm a co-founder and co-director of Native Women Lead. We're an organization that supports indigenous women entrepreneurs and leaders, uh, pretty much grassroots since 2017, uh, primarily volunteer led and started with a bunch of indigenous women around a table, asking what makes us different, what makes us unique, how do we address the challenges and the problems that we see in our communities through entrepreneurship and how do we help ourselves and one another um, as we continue to grow our businesses and grow our leadership path. So uh, fast forward a couple of years later and now we're an organization that's raising a $10 million fund and actually re redesigning capital and looking at it from the lens of a matriarch from an indigenous woman's perspective on how to um, deploy capital as well as um, work with entrepreneurs so they are fully supported in their entrepreneurial journey to realize their dreams and goals. Um, so yeah, that's me and really grateful to be able to do this work and now um, I'll, I guess, send it over to Jasper. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Jamie. I know there's so much more. I'm a big fan of your work ever since I first met you um, and thank you for introducing yourself. Uh, Jasper, on to you. Thank you, Lena and Jamie. It's so um, such an honor to share this stage with you. Um, and um, Lena, I want to say you're such a visionary and so inspiring. And thank you for for this invitation um, to come and share a little bit of the things that that I learned and my organization learned. So, I'm Jasper or Jasper van Brakel, um, originally from the Netherlands. Um, spent some time um, in Germany as well, in Switzerland and in the United States since about 12 years and calling in from Coast Miwok land in the Bay Area, um, San Francisco area in the United States tonight. Um, well, tonight, my time um, <laughs> in the morning, your time, I know. Um, so my journey um, is really been um, evolving around social enterprises and throughout my work life i've been working in and supporting and helping finance social enterprises because i believe in business as a force for good it doesn't always have to be dis destructive and we saw such fantastic examples um, um, today in 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 the few videos that uh, that i was able to witness and i i hope i'll be able to see more of them because those are the 
not only the stories, but really the examples um, that give me hope um, because business can be a force for good. And that requires that we put money to work towards healing, as Namaka says. Um, you know, it's, it's about putting money to work so that it can work towards healing, towards good, rather than to extract from human beings, from the land, um, and from our planet. So my um, um, role um, in, in our organization, RSF Social Finance, it's really around doing just that, activating money. So we work with investors, um, we provide debt, um, loans to social entrepreneurs, we do some investing as well, and work um, with people around their philanthropic funds um, as well. Um, we do that with a team of uh, fantastic people, mostly based in the Bay Area. Uh, we have about 25 employees. Um, but we work throughout the United States and Canada. So our, our um, geographical um, reach as an organization is really focused on the northern part of North America. We do a little bit in Mexico, but it's mostly United States and, um, and some of it in Canada. RSF has been around since the mid-1980s, and um, we um, have a loan fund, we have philanthropic uh, funds, as well as several thematic funds that I'm happy to share about later in the conversation. Thank you very much, Jasper. I love how you did the land acknowledgement in the beginning of what you say. When I'm in California, I always do that it's in the land of the Ohlone people. I'm calling in from Singapore. Uh, and we have our indigenous people, I always say the land of the Malay people, before we were colonized. Um, Kate, over to you, to your introduction. Hi, my name is Kate Cochran. I am the CEO of Upaya Social Ventures. We are a nonprofit organization that invests in companies in India, specifically with a goal to create jobs for the extreme poor. We've been doing this for 10 years and um, we have a particular focus on empowering rural areas and also making sure that our active portfolio is evenly balanced between men and women founders uh, because we really believe in the power of women founders and women entrepreneurs in um, having strong impact in poverty alleviation. Thank you very much. So let us jump right into conversation here. Uh, I talked in my opening a little bit more about the funding gap. So let's explore the funding gap. And I'd like to start with you, Jamie. Could you speak from your perspective, both as an Indigenous entrepreneur yourself, as well as one helping other Indigenous entrepreneurs? I believe you support about 5,000 Indigenous entrepreneurs. How do you see this funding gap? And how have you seen philanthropic dollars play a key role in shifting that? So access to capital is a big issue in our communities. Um, we definitely see where entrepreneurs don't have access to traditional finance, financing uh, institutions such as banks and community development institutions. Um, kind of interestingly enough, because of uh, the tribes and the nations that are here in the United States, a lot of banks are nervous to do business in our communities because um, they, they can't get collateral in case somebody should default. Uh, so it's actually really systemically um, excluded Indigenous people in this country. Uh, we've also had a lot of issues around predatory lending. So a lot of people actually have financial trauma in our communities around um, getting loans at exorbitant amounts, as well as um, being able to, like I said, build um, secure other, other types of investment. I'm sorry, my dog is barking. <laughs> um, it's all right. Our, our communities, just like any other entrepreneur in the in this country, they uh, they need financing to start a business and grow a business. Uh, we did research in our in our network, and entrepreneurs need at least fifty thousand dollars to start, and that's just to pay for equipment, a space for you know staff or um, products, services, etc. So they um, often are missed because they cannot access a traditional financial institution, and then. The microfinance, which I actually used to work in, they don't um, fund enough dollars for them to be able to access that um, critical amount so they can actually start or grow. 
Thank you very much. I'm sure your dog is enjoying the session as much as I am listening to you. Uh, Jasper, I remember very distinctly when I first heard you speak at Transformative Finance Conference and you talked about how really we have commoditized people and planet and that's a key problem that we have and how this has to change. RSF, as you said in your opening, has really led the way on integrated finance, which includes grants from philanthropic sources. Can you give your take on why and how you see philanthropy playing a very key role in helping marginalized communities and ending poverty? Thank you for that great question. Um, it's, um, I think there is a simple answer as well as a much longer, but I'll stick to the, to the brief um, one for today. So um, I think we need to break through the, the assumption that there's um, money that's there to be invested and that needs to make market rate return. And then there's a whole different kind of money and it's called philanthropy. Um, what, what the way I look at it and the way we are trying to look at it at RSF is they are on a spectrum. And um, on, the, on one end of the spectrum, it's all about the financial return and the impact is really only, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, it's, it's maybe an, 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 a welcome side effect, but it's really not the intention. And all the way on the other side of the spectrum, you have philanthropy where you have basically a negative 100% return, right? From a financial perspective, but you really optimize and maximize for impact. And the way that we look at it at RSF is there's a lot of space in between just giving um, a dollar away 100% and looking uh, for market rate returns. And um, several, so let me give you an example. Um, Diaspora um, company, which is a spice company that um, works with mostly women in, um, in India actually, that RSF was able to provide a loan to. Um, and then we also were able to come in with um, a grant out of one of the collaborative philanthropic funds that RSF um, has, um, that we have raised money into, that um, um, together with the loan provide more of a package, so this integrated capital approach. and. You know, in, in the case of Diaspora, it's, um, it, it, I, was, I was shocked to read this statistic, so I want to share it with you, and you probably all know this, but only 2% of what the consumer pays for the spices actually goes to the growers. Wow. Yeah, 2%. Wow. And there, there is an average of 10 intermediaries in between. So this company, Diaspora, is trying to break through that um, and to cut out the 10 middlemen they're usually men um, in this um, in, in in this system, and so what RSF was able to do is um, through providing a loan, a grant, but also community support. So there's also an element of human capital and network capital and social capital that's part of this integrated capital approach that's necessary for the social entrepreneurs to be able to be successful. Um, so um, is that philanthropy? Yes, in part, but it's also a loan. And you know, it could also be a small equity investment. We, we do that sometimes as well. So rather than approaching it with a one size fits all, we're trying to approach it with what's really needed in this particular situation and then to fine tune the different elements of financial and non-financial capital. Wow. Thank you. That example is so pertinent about 2% only flowing down. There's so much that's broke in terms of how the community itself can build their wealth back. Thank you for sharing such a concrete example, Jasper. I think we'll be able to come back to a lot more of the other structures that you have. Uh, Kate, you have been involved in impact investing for such a long time, yet even your fund, Upaya Ventures, turns to philanthropic dollars to fill the funding gap. What do you think is the key reason for this gap? And how do you see the role of philanthropic dollars in restorative investing? So I think that sometimes when people think about impact investing, they have this idea of you have to do well and do good and that there's one model. But I don't think of it that way. I, I really, I've always thought of it as a continuum. 
And in recent years, I think that there has been more understanding that there is a lot of work to be done um, in the continuum between either pure investing on this side and pure philanthropy on this side. There, there's a need for both of these, but there's a lot of need in the middle for, uh, you know, maybe, I, I kind of don't like this word, but people use the word concessionary capital. Capital that isn't trying to reach a market return, but has, you know, a clear impact vision that it wants to accomplish. I mean, I think that's what we do at Upaya. Um, very often people talk about the missing middle in terms of companies that um, are too big for microfinance, but they're too small for traditional finance and sometimes even for impact investing. Um, those are the companies that, that we invest in. But the reason it's missing um, is because, you know, in, there need to be more investors and more creative structures that work for companies that don't look like Silicon Valley startups. They aren't going to be growing at you know rocket ship levels, and that's okay. If they can grow at you know a reasonable ten or fifteen percent a year, and they get profitable, and they can repay their investors with some return that isn't an outlandish return, that provides a recyclable form of capital that can do a lot of good in the world. You know, I am you know deeply grateful to philanthropists who make grants, um, but Anybody who's ever worked in a nonprofit organization knows that raising, you know, fundraising for philanthropy is an ongoing and sometimes exhausting task. You know, you have to raise money every year for your operating budget, and then the next year you have to raise it again. The thing that I think is most exciting about our model and the models that we're seeing coming come up is there's a way to have social impact with a renewable source of capital, um, with this kind of missing middle um flavor of capital and you know you don't have to do these plain vanilla equity kinds of investments that are you know you're looking for you know a big return because nine out of the ten investments you make in your portfolio aren't going to work but the tenth one has to be really big like that model does not work when you are working for social impact and poverty alleviation and i think that we need to match the flavor of capital to the goals of the investors and Investors need to be really comfortable saying, you know, I, I don't need to maximize my return here. I want to use my capital in a way where I might get the capital back, but I'm really looking for impact. It's not an either or of grants or investments anymore. Thank you so much, Kate. I love the way that you describe the entire continuum of the spectrum and all the different expectations that people have. And also the concept of the recyclability of philanthropic dollars. That's actually the kind of work that Angels of Impact does, is that we look at taking philanthropic dollars and then helping the communities, but the money comes back so you can do more and more good. So thank you for bringing that point up, Kate. Uh, I'm now going to move on to the, sec the third part of what I said in the introduction as well. Often people feel that flowing money to marginalized communities alone is enough. They don't really look deeper into how the deal is structured or dealt with, or how they create the deal flow, or how they overcome unconscious biases, how they see risk, how they structure the deal how they look at even success, to name but a few, right? So I'm going to come back to you again, Jamie. Your organization is started by Indigenous women, for Indigenous women. I'd like to see, you know, if you could share some of the important terms that matter, the important approaches that matter, and also share your experience of your own funds with character-based lending and other initiatives that you're currently involved in. Thank you. Appreciate that. Oh, where to start? Um, so as I mentioned before, we're community led. Um, a lot of our programs and the offerings we give to the community we serve are actually designed uh, by our community. So we ask them like, what are the challenges? What are the barriers? How do you think we should overcome that? And we've actually built out a lot of our programming around that. Um, and also a little bit of research that we do within our community. So. We've actually structured this $10 million fund very much modeled as a, at, um, as a result of RSF's work in, in looking at an integrated capital stack. Um, so we're looking at philanthropic dollars, which we think is critical to at least um, supporting entrepreneurs and looking at you know equity as well, looking at loan, looking at forgivable loans, uh, recoverable grants, et cetera, um, because we feel like those different types of capital can also serve um, 
a different purpose, like at each stage of the entrepreneurial journey. And we've actually, in addition to um, looking at underwriting practices in, in communities and, or just in the US, a lot of um, banks use the five C's of credit, which is a very traditional underwriting um, process in which they look at people's credit scores, how much um, assets they have, like collateral, what the local market looks like, uh, the conditions, and um, they look at their character as well as their capacity to repay debt. Because our communities have been economically excluded, um, it actually puts us in a very um, terrible position to be able to qualify under those basic underwriting tenants. So what we did is we essentially said, okay, we need to look at <clears throat> the five C's of credit, but really in a different way that is that'll that, that supports people to not only upskill and support their entrepreneurial dreams, but to actually have a, an entry point into accessing capital. So we're actually uh, recoining it the five R's of reimmatriation, and we're looking at underwriting practices from an indigenous woman's um, lens as far as um, re as far as what what we would like to see in, in investment and impact. So I'm going to kind of go all over the place here, but what that looks like for us is not seeking a typical return or impact metric. So we're not looking at like a 5% return rate or, you know, we're not looking to essentially make all the money back. Um, because some of the things that are important to our communities aren't just money. For example, we know that indigenous women in this country, four and five of us will experience violence in our lifetime. If an entrepreneur is supported in her journey, she's able to maintain and access economic safety and safety nets and stability. Therefore, she's able to just have safety in her life um, and she's protected. What's, what's the return on investment of a woman's safety for a year, of two years, three years? Those things are really hard to measure, but we know they're important in our community because we see it right in front of our community. We see that's happening. Um, so we're really trying to push this narrative about what impact looks like and also even how we define impact. Our measures of wealth, for example, in a lot of our communities are very different. It may be how many, how much assets you have, what's your net worth, how much money do you have in the bank. In our communities, it's do you have access to your elders? Do you have access to your language? Do you have access to ceremony? Can you go home? Um, so those things are really different and we're trying to kind of understand how these two, I guess, worldviews or frameworks intersect and match and, and don't align and that's okay. Um, but what we're doing in, in microfinance right now and soon to be in that like, hopefully that middle spot is um, we're trying to test relationship-based lending. So how much social capital actually supports entrepreneurs? Sorry, my off here. Um, and what we're seeing is actually our, the, the people that we work with, the indigenous women that we work with, are paying off their debts faster than anybody else in our cohort. So long as they're supported with a repayment plan, with technical assistance, and we have a strong relationship with them so they know they're cared for. And it's, it's actually proving that uh, indigenous women are investable, they aren't risky investments, and they're actually um, the ones closest to the solutions. And I, I think for me, when I think about the network we serve, two thirds of us are the breadwinners and the bread makers, I joke, in the community. So we're the one that actually could have the greatest impact in our communities because we're already doing that. We're already the economic drivers. So why not fund us, fund our dreams so that we can continue to have that impact and have a greater ripple effect um, for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie, for taking us back also to the realities on the ground with indigenous communities in particular, you know, and how impact really needs to be redefined on what it means to the community. Uh, and I like the analogy that you use about the break makers. Here at Angels of Impact, we like to call uh, you the weavers of a fabric of society because you weave the fabric that holds resiliency. And it's really what the world needs today, I believe. So thank you. I know it's a very brief introduction, but I hope this audience will 
get a sense of you know the depth of the issue and i love how you reminded us about looking at impact metrics in a very different way and looking at success in a different way too so thank you jamie jasper we'll come to you next it, as you mentioned rsf has been at the cutting edge of you know uh, paving the way for integrated capital uh, you use many tools as you said there are many different funds that you have i know you have one around women uh, and more recently, you actually did launch one around racial justice and racial wealth build building. So I'd like to turn to you about how non-extractive funding initiatives can really help marginalized communities. Jasper. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I want to um, answer that with a little bit of a loop, but I will get back to actually answering your question. And my loop is that it not only matters what is being funded or who is being funded, but it also matters who makes the decision, who's in the room when decisions are made, and how are those funding decisions made? And um, so it was really important um, to us at RSF that we look at our own organization and our own decision-making processes and also the 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 way that we work with our partners our investors our community uh, of investors and so it was really important to us that um, we establish a board of our own organization with majority women and half um, of our board members identify as a person of color that was really important um, two-thirds of our staff is female, 60% of our executive team. So I'm speaking to you as a white man, right? And I recognize that I need to, and we need to surround ourselves with um, uh, people who have a different perspective if we want to actually impact um, change um, from a gender and racial justice perspective. So that was my little loop. Um, now, going um, to your question, so yes, we have um, a women's capital collaborative and also a racial justice collaborative. Those are thematic pools of philanthropic money out of which we can do um, really the deepest impact, most catalytic um, funding. So it can be technical assistance grants, it can be recoverable grants, it can be an, an, um, an what they call unsecured. It's not a great term, but the technical term is unsecured loan. I really love relationship lending. That is that's fantastic, um, and also you know equity um, investments that we can do out of those funds. Um, the Women's Capital Collaborative really focuses on female founders, owners, and CEOs, um, and the Racial Justice Collaborative really focuses on black, indigenous, and other people of color um, who are leading, owning, um, or have founded an organization, and also organizations that um, directly support marginalized communities. And the, the one thing I want to share about the, the Racial Justice Collaborative, that's a little bit different from the other collaborative funds that RSF has, because we have a number of those thematic uh, funds. What's different with the Racial Justice Collaborative is that we wanted to organize accountability to, our, to what we say we want to do in a different way. So we are working with four outside external advisors who help us um, be held accountable to the change and the impact that we say we want to make with this money. Also recognizing that we are not always the closest to the communities and the networks that we are looking to serve. And we want to learn and get better at that. Um, and, um, and that is why we, we are working with external advisors who are helping us identify opportunities and also help us um, be held accountable. Thank you so much, Jasper. I love the complexity of your answer because you have different layers to it, right? So the first layer is we don't just have women as beneficiaries or marginalized communities as beneficiaries, but also as the decision makers. So you actually went into how that structure of decision making was very important. 
And then you also talk about the accountability, which I thought was very, very, very powerful. The other point that I also liked is that philanthropic dollars actually is what gives you the flexibility to come up with the entrepreneur friendly and community relevant uh, structures. So thank you for uh, sharing that with us. And for those of you who want to learn more, obviously you can also go to the RSF website and find out more about the different collaborative uh, tools that um, Jasper mentioned. Next, we will go to you, Kate, because I think uh, you have a lot that you can add as well. Capital, right? And the flexibility that philanthropic dollars is coming. Um, so the concept is not just flowing money to flop marginalized communities, but how it flows, right? How has your organization been working to really structure this in a way that helps to eradicate poverty through your financing structures? Yeah, I'm glad you, you asked that because, you know, I, when I talk about Upaya, I try to be very careful to not, not say that we create jobs. It's always the entrepreneur who creates the jobs and our job is to enable them to be successful. And one of the ways that we think we can do that is by providing them flexible capital, by providing them opportunities to pay us back early. Um, we've been doing convertible notes into India recently with interim repayments. And part of the reason we do that is it's not that we want to control these companies. We want to give capital to the entrepreneurs when they need it. Um, and we will accept you know, a lower ultimate return in exchange for them paying us back earlier so that we can invest in other companies. Um, we never look to control uh, the companies we work in. Uh, and, and it's not just, as you said, flowing capital into the companies. It's also helping entrepreneurs get the connections to professional services, to um, peers whom they can learn from. You know, anything we can do to help um, and an enterprise that may be in you know, a fairly remote area get connected to an ecosystem that can help it be successful. I think that there is flexibility in terms of, you know, if I were um, beholden to limited partners who are looking to me to ensure quick exits so that they could get their money back, I would probably have to make different decisions from an impact perspective. You know, we have companies in our portfolio um, who have had a lot of ups and downs in the last seven or eight years but we've been able to stay with them and they have therefore been able to maintain the jobs that they've created and they, they're growing uh, those jobs. And that's our priority. We still hope to get an exit from them, but I don't wanna push them to give us an exit because I have limited partners that I am beholden to. Um, and one thing I should say is, you, know, you mentioned, um, you referred to us as a fund. Technically, we're not a fund, we are a nonprofit that accepts grants um, and pools of them as recoverable grants. And that also gives me a lot of flexibility, uh, which I can use you know, to maximize the impact. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, I also like the fact that you emphasize the fact about the flexibility that comes out of it. So towards the end, we're coming towards the end of our panel. So I want to talk a little bit more about a concept that all of you alluded to which is really the non-financial help and assistance to support enterprises working to alleviate poverty through helping other community-based enterprises as well. So in the non-financial gap uh, area, I'd like to kind of go to Jamie and see what have you been doing uh, in your community uh, to really support the non-financial aspects of supporting your entrepreneurs? Thank you. We initially started, like I said, as very volunteer led, a bunch of women around the table thinking, how do we support one another? What makes us very different? And we landed on our core values is that Indigenous women are the backbones of community. We're emerging as entrepreneurs. Um, we're weaving our culture, our community, and connect connections to manifest change and empower one another. So we use that as our framework whenever we develop um, programming or tools that support our network. Uh, so non financial. We provide technical assistance on you know, how to grow, how to start a business. We provide a safe, brave, inclusive space so that Indigenous women can convene and be in community with one another. And that actually has helped us to learn a lot about our community um, through research and data collection so that we can advocate and also design our programs that are relevant and uh, responsive to their needs and, and what they prioritize. Uh, we also are now looking at um, professional personal development that's woven in because we're really trying to look at the entrepreneur 
um, from a whole woman's perspective, from the to honor the complexity, the beauty, um, the in, the the wisdom, the ancestral wisdom that exists um, with each of these women that we serve. Um, and also, there's I think someone had spoke. One of the entrepreneurs had said this earlier about the impact um, in their community around trauma. So we're definitely taking a very much uh, like a trauma informed lens in anything that we design, including financial tools, um, because we know that exists and that we know that that can also affect um, people as they're building their businesses, they're entering spaces where there is no representation of them. Um, so we essentially are trying to look at the work we do from a, a, a from a perspective of power building from an individual family community. Um, systems level approach. So that's what I would say is like the, the non-financial um, ways that we support. And I don't know if that was accurate in your question, but. No, that's absolutely, what I absolutely. You talk about um, ways in bringing uh, power building, I think that's very important. And of course, there's so many different issues. One of the things I love about um, Native Women Lead, I know at your business summit that I've attended, uh, is you have healers at the center. So you really look at the entrepreneur as a whole, and I found that very, very empowering. I loved every single session that I've been to and meeting all the amazing Native American uh, entrepreneurs too. So thank you, Jamie. Um, thank you. Jasper, uh, I just kind of wanted to, I, so Jamie talked about power building with her entrepreneurs. And one of the things I've always loved about RSF is also about power sharing. You uh, talked a little bit about that. So when I t address this question on non-financial gaps, I'd like you to talk, tell people a little bit more about, uh, uh, you have a, a methodology of uh, investee and investors sitting at the table coming up with terms. You have this participatory making of how grants are giving up. Please tell us more about what you do for power, shifting the power balance. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. And we're, we're doing something that, um, initially um, sounds um, totally out there and kind of a romantic idea but you know people like to say that's never going to work well it's worked for 12 years straight and really well so um, what we do with our loan fund and it's there's a there's about 130 million dollars or so in the loan fund um, at this point um, is that every quarter we meet with a self-selected group of investors in the fund, as well as borrowers who have taken loans out of that fund. And we sit around, we like that to be a round table, um, and, or, you know, today it's a Zoom table. Um, and we talk about the realities that people experience in their own lives as it relates to either their investment or their loan out of the fund. And it's really remarkable and every quarter I attend every single one of them and I just love um, being in those meetings because every quarter um, we notice that there are always investors coming to the table hoping that they will leave that meeting with a higher return for themselves, right? That's the paradigm that, um, that we all know. And borrowers who come to that meeting in the hope that at the end of the meeting they're going to be paying less because of of how we facilitate those meetings what happens is that the focus shifts from me to we so we make the interdependency visible of the community of investors and borrowers and rsf as an intermediary and we talk about what's going to happen if we increase the rate by 25 basis points or what happens if we decrease it and let's look at what is right for this system, for this community, not only for me or for you, but for the for the system to really build a healthy community that's sustainable, that is fair, that is not extractive, but regenerative. And again, I told you, this is gonna sound romantic. So we've been doing this for 12 years, every single quarter, and it helped us through two major recessions, it has helped our borrowers in a big way because we are not tied to LIBOR or Wall Street telling us what the rate is going to be. It's our community setting the rate. Um, and um, of course, we're not immune to market forces. They play a role and you know, we, we talk about that, but it's the community setting the, 
the, the rate. I'll, I'll be really quick in, in the second part of my answer. Um, I don't want to take um, too much time. The, in, in, on the philanthropic side, we work with individuals and organizations to help cut that that proverbial cord between money and power, right? Those things are always connected in our world. And, and when we talk about philanthropy, it can become a transactional thing. And whereas philanthropy, we believe, should be a true gift, it should be a gift. And a gift does not expect something in return. I'm not giving my daughter a birthday present and saying, honey, I want this and that back, right? That's not the nature of a gift. Um, so we work with our donors and also with grantees on processes around participatory granting, around democratizing um, philanthropy that help the communities that are to be supported to um, determine amongst themselves who should, who should get how much money uh, from the donor. Perhaps some of the non-financial gaps that you fill, I mean, you alluded to it here. Perhaps you could talk a little bit more about how some of these non-financial services that you offer are also very key to ending, uh, filling this gap. Yeah, so when we uh, make an investment, we are almost always the first um, institutional investor. And so we're working with very early stage companies and they have different gaps. Um, you know, very often they haven't put in place a financial system or an MIS system, uh, and we can help them oversee that um, and help them understand their business at a quantitative level that maybe they haven't understood before. The other thing that we do, which, you know, I think is a bit um, unusual among, even among impact investors, is we really prioritize working with them on their impact management, um, helping them communicate their vision for impact um, through a theory of change. You know, all of the entrepreneurs we work with want to have impact, have thought about how they're going to have impact, but they may not have put in place the systems to track that. And that's something, to be honest, our team is really good at. Um, and so we help build the systems or you know, help tweak systems that they already have so that they know whether they're having the impact they expect, and if they're not, what kinds of changes they might want to um, make to their program model, their business model, uh, to be able to have that kind of impact. It also, down the road, will help them raise more capital from impact investors if they have an evidence-driven impact model and not just a theory. Thank you so much. Uh, all this conversation has actually been gathering a lot of uh, feedback in the chat. We actually had two questions, but we don't have time to go through both of them. So, but we're going to go over a little bit. So I just do want to uh, address this question and either Jamie or any of you could just jump in on this if you like. Um, specifically, the question is a lot of investors, you know, they tend to have a cognitive dissonance, right? If they're giving money to philanthropy, yes, they deal with a different world. But when they're giving money to investments, they think differently. And there's sort of a cognitive dis dissonance there. Do any of you have suggestions on how more investors could be, impact investors especially, to be convinced to look, rethink the way they invest into marginalized communities. So, would Jamie or, Jamie? Yeah. Yeah. I, I know that we're all connected as human beings and I always would in, in impress upon investors, philanthropy, decision makers, wealth holders, to really think of it from that perspective as just a human being. You know, like just also like think about it from the the person walking in their shoes, essentially, like really thinking about what their entrepreneurial journey looks like, what potential challenges they may have, and also what um, things beyond their control are actually like challenging them. So I think that always helps to um, help people see from another perspective and and really think, well, does it make sense then if I'm expecting a 5% return? Does this make sense if I'm expecting them to grow 100 jobs, you know, in the next couple of years? So I think just connecting on that very human heart-centered level is really, I think, was is what moves people. Thank you, Jamie. Um, Jasper, I'm sorry, Kate, we don't have time to jump into you, but Jasper, would you like to just jump in? Sure. And what a great question. Um, I think 
it um, it all it it all starts with starting to see money as a tool and not as a goal. And once we start realizing and understanding that money doesn't rule us, you know, we shouldn't be the ones that are, um, um, you know, told what to do basically by money or by capital, but we can decide what to do with it. And, you know, asking ourselves, what's our money doing, you know, when, um, when we're asleep and what is, how do I feel about that? And it, it does go to, to that human heart connection. Um, I completely agree. And, and I, I, again, I, I really think the crux is in seeing money as a tool, as a tool for change or as a tool to continue the status quo or as a tool to continue to be extractive. I mean, what do we really want to do with money? Absolutely. It's really time for us to ask ourselves, how can we use money differently in this world? So on that note, we're coming to the end, but I would always like to end with each of you giving some words of wisdom. Um, and I would like to start always with you, Jamie. Uh, and I want to tie it a little bit also to the climate change agenda, because we just came out of COP26 and the whole world is thinking about that, right? Just some words that you would like to share with us to end this. Thank you. Uh, to all the entrepreneurs, you know, I just um, honor your wisdom and your ancestral wisdom and uh, the, the, the insight that you bring from your culture and your worldview and your lens. And I think that's important to uplift, to honor your story and the story of your people and your community. Um, so yeah, just keep holding that close and, and um, and then in, in, in light of climate change, you know, I think Indigenous people can truly inform how business can be done better. That is not extractive with people um, or our planet. It actually can be um, prosperity for all of us. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie, so much. And Jasper, I, given all the work that RSF has done, I really would love to hear your perspective as well and some words of wisdom. Yeah, um, I, I, I would like to echo um, a lot of what Miss Georgia Tan said in, in her address. Um, climate change isn't something that's isolated. Um, it is, um, it's human made, first of all. So it's climate change is really mm -hmm. human behavior that change mm -hmm. that's making the planet change. And the impact, you know, we're all impacted by climate change, but not equally. And um, that, you know, in, in its turn, exacerbates social um, uh, injustice, poverty. Um, and again, it's, um, it, it, it impacts women much stronger um, in this world, uh, very clearly so. I mean, the numbers are very clear about it. And at the same time, a lot of the solutions, I believe, are there. Um, technolo technologically, there a lot of possible. A lot is possible, and there are a lot of innovations and ideas. Uh, many of which we saw. I mean, the weavers saying we should determine the price. I mean, that's where it starts. It's wonderful. It's great. That mentality. So the ideas are there. The innovators are there. The entrepreneurs are there. I really think that. And that's the, the humble task that I see for, for us as, as funders and investors and lenders is getting dollars in the hands of the people who have the solution. And um, I am, um, with my organization, really committed to putting more money into the hands of women, of female founders, um, and of female um, owners of organizations that have solutions that help us um, you know, heal our planet and help us heal communities because those two, those two things go hand in hand. As you know, here in this program, we're working with women-led uh, community-based enterprises, all uplifting their communities out of poverty. Just curious with all the work that you've done in India, if you have any words of uh, wisdom or advice to share to them with them. 
Um, so I don't know if they're words of wisdom or advice. Um, you know, I'll just start by saying thank you for, for the work you do. I mean, I'm always inspired by entrepreneurs um, and, and, and not just sort of um, echoing a tagline when I say they're the heroes. It, it's really hard to be an entrepreneur. And yet the entrepreneurs are the ones who see the opportunities, who push past, you know, things that more, most reasonable people would walk away from and say it's not worth it. And they, they are the economic engines in these communities in so many ways. I mean, we've certainly seen it um, in our own portfolio in the last two years with COVID. So many horrible stories were coming out of India about uh, micro entrepreneurs who suddenly had absolutely no income. They had no way to run their small businesses. They had no money coming in. Um, but when we went to the people employed by the companies we've invested in, uh, the majority of them, two thirds of them were still earning money, even though their companies may not have been earning any revenue, they're continuing to pay their, um, pay their, their job holders. And the reason that they were doing that is that's the reason the entrepreneurs were in this business. They were trying to drive economic empowerment into their communities. And so they held their communities together. And um, so, so I think that, you know, everybody who is attending this conference should feel very, very proud um, of the, the work that they're doing and, you know, know that if sometimes it seems that the obstacles are, are too steep, you know, that, that's what entrepreneurs are made to do, is to, to scale those obstacles. Thank you so much, all of you. I, I really, really appreciate Jamie, Jasper and Kate for being here with us today you know i know it's late for you um and with the new daylight savings times as well it got a little confusing trying to coordinate all of this but i'm so glad it came together i hope everyone in the audience will rethink how we can look at philanthropic dollars to go into restorative investing there is a funding gap that needs to be filled and we have models, we have people who are paving the way, we have models that we can emulate, and it's really time for us to show up differently and make an impact in the community-based enterprises and indigenous communities that will really lift us up to creating a better world for all of us. Uh, on that note, thank you once again, uh, and we're gonna move into, for thank those you. of you who missed uh, the first day, we actually have a recap video so you can get a glimpse of what happened yesterday. Thank you. Today marks the culmination of the year-long fellowship to support our women entrepreneurs. And it is an opportune moment for us to celebrate the power that women have to embark on their own paths of their own choosing and to play an active role to contribute fully to our community. To ensure that all women and men have equal rights. To achieve gender equality and empowerment of women, particularly amidst the challenges brought about the, by the COVID-19 pandemic. We seek to change this as we see these women as weavers of the fabric of a resilient community. It is their hard work that inspires us, the volunteers and people in our network to offer our time, resources and networks to amplify their work. And we believe such partnerships between, you know, the public, the private and plural partnerships are, are, are really important to develop ASEAN economies and for sustainable reasons and also to drive inclusive growth. Hi everyone, welcome back. I loved that panel discussion just now. I think it really, the whole paradigm, it's not even a paradigm shift, it's like a whole paradigm shake-up of like how we want to use money in a way that, you know, in something that Laina alluded in the in her film, uh, in a uh, video earlier about money being medicine. 
and not being you know something that extractive and things like that so the whole power building power sharing was something that i personally took away from and, and thank you so much to all of the panelists uh, who dialed in for that i think that was a really great session um, we are going to go into a fashion show just a little bit before we do that i've mentioned a couple of times that we are going to have a people's choice award right for the community-based enterprises booth so we are going to have a tech survey come up just in a bit all right if you could actually just click on the tech survey button um, that is right below the video if you don't see it um, just do a quick refresh okay uh, and then once you see it, please pick your favorite community-based enterprise and let's all help them win an exciting prize, right? So we are also going to be waiting for some of the social and uh, the community-based enterprises to be coming back from their separate session. Um, and so if you could just take a bit of time to choose your favorite community-based enterprises and uh, just let us know. Um, you know, uh, to do that. Did you get a chance to go and check out all the booths yesterday? I did. It was so many of them. There's so many pictures that yeah. is so great. And I think you could see the amount of effort that all of Absolutely. this um, community-based enterprises have been putting in. And I think it's also, what was really remarkable for me was just the thoughtfulness in how a lot of them yeah. approach the work. I mean, you've been working with quite a bit of them. Like, Do you want to share? Yeah, more. the process of, of putting together those pitches and, and putting them up onto their booths was really exciting for a lot of the community-based enterprises and they worked really hard um, yeah, on no, that I work. Imagine. I also want to call out for those that are visiting the booths. Uh, Pavani, I think, put this from the Angels of Impact team into the chat, but some of the pitches are in different languages. So if that's the case, uh, you can click on the CC button at the bottom and there will be translation for you. Yeah, that's great. I love how inclusive this entire uh, two days conference have been. You know, I personally work as a diversity, equity yeah. and inclusion practitioner uh, in a tech company. Uh, and one of the things that we've been really trying to move forward with is, you know, how do we make it a lot more accessible? How do we make things a lot more inclusive? Uh, and just being a part of this two days event has shown, you know, we have live translation. So thank you to all of the live translators. Um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have been really benefiting from it. And then now that we have the uh, translation of the site, uh, you know, we want people to feel empowered. Um, and I think one of the things uh, that I think Jasper mentioned in the panel earlier was to actually meet people where they are, right? And like to, to know that we don't have all the answers yeah. and we're working with, with so many other people who actually know what's happening. Um, so that is really important. So please go and check out the booths. Um, and I hope you've already uh, chosen your favorite community-based enterprise on the survey uh, because I will be announcing this later on. I'm excited. So with that, shall we go on shall we to get into it? the fashion show? Yep. Great. So we are having four different ASEAN Wise fellow brands doing a fashion showcase. Um, I have to call out that I have not watched any of these shows because uh, and Maddie is a bit closer to these community-based enterprises. So I may have um, certain reactions, but we're really excited for this. Um, so let's go to the first one.
process. Okay, great. Oh, wow, I loved Kamana's reversible blazers. I think <laughs> I, I really love that. Amazing. Amazing. So we are going to go on to the next one, which is Tosang. Let's see it. This is Tosang Cotton Yards in Thailand. Oh, this is the one by the Mekong. Yeah, that, that. Yes. Like if I have a product, it's going to be by the Mekong. I love how well made this video is. Is there a hand guy? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's because of the video. Like the video has sound. So I can't play ball. So I don't know. Oh, okay. Oh, look at that. Okay, so you can see Prairie on the side. Oh yeah, that, yeah. So this is her studio. It's so cool how they built this right out into the church. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like the whole runway. <laughs> In the wow. actual, by the river themselves. That's pretty cool. I like how they're also having like products for men. I think whenever we talk about slow fashion, it kind of feels like it's always geared towards like female fashion, but it's kind of like, oh my word, <laughs> that's beautiful. Oh, look at that. Oh, wow. 
are that things that you know you can kind of wear in the weather that we have in, over here as well. Oh, wow, that's, oh, that was so great. And I think, awesome. you, you know, the, the whole fact that the runway you were saying. Yeah, I was saying they built that runway out in their studio area all by themselves. The whole thing was handcrafted, I loved homemade. It. I loved it. And I was also, um, you know, saying like how, you know, often when we talk about like sustainable fashion, you like the conversation is quite geared towards like female fashion, yeah, uh, or and or like feminine expressions yeah. of fashion. Uh, but I loved how like they have both, like you know, it's quite a wide spectrum. It could yeah. actually be non-binary yeah. as well. So I really appreciated that. Um, thank you, Tosang. I, I love that. Me. Yeah, we're gonna go next to Tarajamalo. I'm excited for this.
your most recent collection. Yeah, yeah, this one was just launched in June, I think. Oh. I guess it's part during so it's during your the fellowship. Yeah. Wow. During the fellowship. Yeah, yeah so that wow. was that was a great collection that Maddie Loved was it. just ta- telling me that they just launched it in when was it? Don't quote me. I want to say it was June. Yeah, and I love correct me later. Yeah, yes. and I love that <laughs> the uses the, the all the lines in the fabric was really really beautiful the lines yeah. and the interjecting colors yeah. and things like that. I really loved it. I love the jacket. You know, there's yeah. the one scene where she pops the jacket. Yeah. Amazing. It's like, oh, and I also really like all the fringes. The fringes are <laughs> like awesome. it's going to take a lot of a lot of sweat to actually like pull that out. <laughs> I loved it. You uh, can totally pull that out. Come on. <laughs> I'm sure I can. Um, next up we have color silk. <laughs> products from I like all the four different different um, enterprises yeah. like and countries too we have Indonesia Cambodia yeah Thailand all represented there 
I know. And, and I also like, you know, one of the things I really appreciated was how distinct yes. each of these enterprises are, yes. like in terms of like their style, the aesthetics, yeah. the use of colors. I know there were a couple of, of ones where I was really excited. I'm like, I didn't want it for myself. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> which is which is really like I'm I'm sure like you know those of you who are also like dialing in and listening is into this like some of you may some of the products um, have uh, caught your eye. Just like you know, I I mean it is it has caught my eye. And you know, we we wanted to put on that fashion show, not just you know to just showcase the products, but we also wanted to make sure that you know that these are the products that are yeah. available from our enterprises, and you can actually check out these products as well as a whole bunch of others from the different enterprises. They're exquisite. They're sustainably manufactured, um, and you can do this by visiting their booths yeah. under the exhibitor tab. And then you know you either want to purchase their products. I know I'm gonna do <laughs> a bit of that. Yeah, uh, and you can also. Also, you know, if you're interested in partnerships, uh, you can also connect with the teams uh, as well. Yeah, we should also call out that fashion shows like these take a lot of partnerships. So thank you to Maybank also for helping to produce some of these videos and supporting the community-based enterprises in Wise, yeah. making this whole show possible. It was so beautiful. It was such a beautifully made thing. I feel like yeah. I'm at like Paris Fashion Week or something <laughs> yeah, like that. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you know, one of the things I've heard while I was preparing for this was was also that Angels uh, actually worked with some of, with, with this uh, enterprises for some uh, key partnership facilitation. Do you want to share a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So we were really proud of many of the community-based enterprises in the WISE program throughout that were able to enter the Singapore market uh, specifically. So I want to give a quick shout out to Batik Boutique. They're now launching products in the National Gallery in Singapore. If you are someone that prefers to shop in store rather than online, you can head over to National Gallery to check out some of their products. We also had another wise fellow, Saya Brand, launch a new product line oh, wow. with a Singapore brand called Ruma. Very neat logo. Photos are on the uh, booth or are on the website, the platform mm -hmm. um, of this collaboration between the two so you can see kind of how they do that up. Wow. Yeah. And then we had a third, uh, Craven House. I want to put out a shout out to them. Mm -hmm. uh, they're based in Cambodia and they had secured a contract with Muta Wear, another fashion brand in Singapore. So congratulations to all of you for all of your hard work. That sounds amazing. And I know like, you know, because this is this is a gathering of so many different stakeholders yeah. and both enterprises. You know, if you yourself want to partner with any of the wise fellows, uh, please just set a message with them, you know, or interact with them in the lounge later on when we have the networking session. Uh, check out their booths. You know, as much as possible, we do want to make, you know, mimic a live conference setting you know we do want to encourage especially uh, the chat chit chats that you have you know by the corridor when you're picking up like you know some drinks uh, like just go ahead and do that you know this event is as much a partnership building event yeah. um, and we want to you know build awareness of this uh, besides also you know showcasing the work uh, that they've had over the past year um, and I know I will be personally checking out quite a few of, of this Same. this uh, enterprises as well um, so with that, we will now be watching a short video of Angels of Impact before we move on to the final segment of the day.
Hi everyone. Oh, what a wonderful and big two days that we've had, you know. One of the things that I, I keep mentioning is this, this Impactful Woman event is really, you know, a celebration of a year-long fellowship that we've had with this 17 community-based enterprises. Um, and so this next part, we are going to go into a bit of a celebration mode, which I am personally always down for. So we are celebrating the accomplishments of our cohort as well as the volunteers. Right? So there's a total of five award categories that we are going to be going in first and I'm going to be going through them one by one. The first one that we're having is the Air Asia Foundation Branding Award. Right? So I'm not going to be announcing this award. I am going to be inviting somebody else. So I will be inviting the Executive Director of Air Asia Foundation, Ms. Yap Moon Cheng, to say a few words about the award and announce the winner. Ms. Yap, please. Hello, ASEAN WISE. Uh, I'm very glad to see you guys uh, for the third time in your journey with ASEAN WISE. And today, uh, it's my pleasure to announce the winner of the branding um, project that we have promised to work on with the One Academy. Um, so before I get into the uh, eventual winner, I would like to explain a little bit about the criteria that we used uh, to select uh, the project. Uh, firstly, of course, we look at the need of the project, the, the, the scope that uh, the social enterprise has outlined and you know how you have explained what you hope to achieve with branding and market and branding of your your social enterprise and the second of course is also to look at the extent that we can make an impact um, with the limited scope engagement that we have um, so branding alone is just one aspect of it um, and we are also working with students so we also have to assess based on what we think the students can comfortably achieve uh, and do to a, a, a good degree with the with in the time that we have. So uh, for those of you who submitted uh, your request, thank you very much for taking the trouble to think about your brand, think about what are your branding objectives and thinking about you know, where you hope branding can take you to the next level. Um, there are some, of course, that we, we find uh, that you are actually already have nice logos and nice products. And we think that what you actually need is not so much branding, but what you need is a marketing campaign, a marketing support. So uh, you might want to target new audiences, new channels. So that is actually marketing and not necessarily brand. If your brand is had, you know, actually looks pretty good and you know your story, comfortable with your story. Um, and of course, those there are a couple that we find that definitely would be benefit from branding support, but we think branding alone is not sufficient. You will also need help in product support and product design. And unfortunately, that is beyond the scope of what we can do within this short time frame. So we do recommend that you invest in product design before you also look at branding only with the right products that you can brand yourself effectively. Um, thirdly, of course, there are some uh, couple of applicants which we find very interesting. We love the project, but unfortunately, um, you probably need a little bit more sophisticated branding assistance. Um, and we think that the students might not be able to do it justice. We think that if you're going to go the branding route at, at all, you should. Uh, invest in expertise, good expertise to help you do a really solid job with it. Um, having said that, I mean, I've worked on five projects. Students are really good with what they do with the uh, support of our, our uh, uh, trustee, Ms. Gigi Lee. Um, anyway, so without further ado, I am uh, pleased to announce that the winner of the um, ASEAN Wise Air Asia Foundation branding project is Marana Collectibles. Um, I really uh, am looking forward to working with uh, Salika and Marana to see where we can help take them to the next level. Um, for those of you who would like to kind of have a little bit more communication with us uh, who submitted, um, please feel free to connect with ASEAN Wise um, and I'll be glad to sort of give you direct feedback. So for everyone, I wish you all much success and I hope you've had a really fruitful journey with ASEAN WISE this year. Um, may our paths cross again and I really hope that um, as AirAsia Foundation ramps up activities again that we will meet each other once again. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Ms. Yap, for that you know, inspiring speech and supporting the ASEAN WISE Fellowship. And congratulations, Marana, for, for getting that award. You know, we're, really look, we're really looking forward to see how we can further enable uh, you and the rest of the team as well. 
Now, the next award is the Community Choice Award. So, this is when we did the survey. And so, this was also when we actually asked you... Uh, Sorry, the recipient for this award is chosen by the WISE cohort and volunteers based on which enterprise inspired them the most. And so, the winner is... Here and Found! Great! So, led by some great women, May and Fancita, Here and Found preserves and promotes indigenous music and provides economic opportunity to a lost generation of musicians. May and Pesita on winning the Community Choice Award uh, and a cash prize of $1,500 uh, Singapore dollars. Alright, I made a little mistake so earlier with the Community Choice Award. Now we're going to go to the People's Choice Award. I was a bit too you know, ahead of myself. Now this People's Choice Award uh, it's, it's given to the most popular community-based enterprises. So you know, I try to keep telling you, go and break your booths, do the survey earlier. Um, on the poll, so we have put together all of the uh, number of visits and engagements and all of this. Uh, well, I don't know who's actually getting this, so we will find out together. Uh, and the lucky winner is... Chi! Great, congrats to you and team on winning the People's Choice Award and as well as a cash prize of $1,500, uh, Singapore dollars. Oh, I love I love being like Santa Claus and giving out all of these awards. Um, next one is the Make the Change Creative Marketing Services Award. Um, so one of the best things about this ASEAN WISE community is how supportive we are to each other, right? And so that often results in partnerships and collaborations. So this collaboration is initiated by Make the Change, which is a creative design agency social enterprise, and also a WISE fellow from Singapore. Uh, and its co-founder, Michelle Lim, and her team have kindly offered to award pro bono creative services to one other WISE fellow, right? And this re the recipient of this special peer-to-peer -peer award is... Kasuma! So make the change, and Kasuma will continue our partnership beyond the WISE program to connect differently abled women seamstresses in Indonesia with the creative marketing strategies of Make the Change Singapore. So congratulations Fabrina and thank you Make the Change uh, for initiating this partnership. Next, we have the ASEAN WISE Hall of Fame and we will begin with the Star Volunteers Award. Now, the ASEAN WISE program would not be, have been possible without the crucial support of the enterprising volunteers and their contribution, and so we really greatly appreciate it, and we want to celebrate this throughout the program. Uh, while we salute every single one of you for making a huge difference, we would like to recognize those who went the extra mile uh, and made it to the ASEAN um, WISE Hall of Fame. So we have, first of all, Win Vicky Windsor. Yay! And then we also have Alison Skidmore. So this is about on the ASEAN Wise Hall of Fame. Next up, I'm also getting this as, as you are. Macy, congratulations! Next up, we have Ing Huang. Thank you so much for everything that all of you have contributed. Next up, we have Wajahat Mehdi. And I think this is the last one. Stephanie, Stephanie Mualim, thank you so much uh, for all of your contributions to the six of you. Congratulations on being our star volunteers and entering the ASEAN WISE Hall of Fame. Uh, we really appreciate all of the contributions that you've made throughout this program. Thank you so much. Now, the last one. I'm still Santa Claus, so I still am giving stuff out. Uh, so, we have the Star Social Enterprise. <coughs> Sorry, Star Social Enterprise. And just like the Star Volunteers, this award is given to those enterprises that put in an extra effort to make the most out of the WISE program. So before I share their names, I want to highlight that the passion of the enterprises to serve and protect the marginalized, the underprivileged, the more vulnerable communities is truly so inspiring. And I'm sure it has been very, very hard for the team uh, to choose uh, so frankly, all of you are amazing. I do want to call out. Um, 
We are going to call out those who have made to the Hall of Fame. So the first one will be Chi. Congratulations to you. We also have... Who's next? Here and found. Thank you so much. Congratulations, me and Pancita. And Lawe, Perkumpulan Lawe, congratulations, Nindia and Viraswati. We have one more, we have one more. Kamana, congratulations, Bea. Oh, these are all ours. Oh, this is amazing. To, to four of you, congratulations for getting the Star Social Enterprises. Uh, like I say, all of you are doing such, such amazing work. And we do want to recognize those who are also um, doing a bit, um, uh, to making the most out of this WISE program. So, you, we've celebrated a lot of this. Um, I have personally been so inspired over the past couple of days. Uh, I know I've gone on into quite a few of the websites and like, you know, clicking and adding things to cart and just waiting to be shipped out. I do know that shipping could be a bit expensive, uh, but I'm also keeping in mind it is for a good cause. Uh, so let's, I, I'm looking forward to have these products in hand. Uh, so thank you so much for all of the amazing work that you all have been putting in. Uh, however, I do want to call out that, you know, I may be the person in front of the camera, but I, the team that has been running this uh, have been phenomenal. So I am excited to be calling upon the Angels of Impact team. Um, and thank you and have a great day.